you've been really a champion of Carlisle's music um, for some time, and I was just wondering whether you could tell us when you first heard Carlisle's music and, and what made you kind of think, right, I want, I want to direct this. Um, well, it was about um, 15 years ago, I guess, when uh, I, I had an opera agent in America then, and she said, do you know this composer, Carlisle Floyd? And I said, oh, well, I, I know some arias from various operas, and the only opera I'd heard right through was Susanna, which, which I thought was a masterpiece. Mm. And uh, it was a, a great story. It was uh, very melodic. It was beautifully orchestrated. And, you know, it was everything you love in opera. And I, I thought of Carlyle as sort of the American Benjamin Britten. Um, I thought, well, he's just as great. And then she said to me, well, there, there's a new work being... Um, that they're going to do in Houston, and maybe you'd like to direct it. Oh, I nearly fell over. I said, oh, yes, I definitely would. She said, well, you know, we can, you can play, hear it on the piano. It hasn't been recorded yet. So I think I heard the piano. It was, it's, a, again, it's Cole Sassy Tree. It's a, it's a beautiful opera. Um, again, it's, it's like, uh, like all of his work in the sense, I mean, the, the operas are all different. I think I've heard about five or six of them now, including Wuthering Heights, and um, is it Jonathan Wade that, mm -hmm. yes, it's wonderful. It is, uh, and a couple I saw on, on DVD that I borrowed when I was there, uh, uh, there in Texas. Um, they were all beautiful, they were all different, but they were all, they, again, they were all distinctively Carlisle's, but they weren't repetitive. Um, and it was while I was there doing Susanna, uh, doing a Cole Sassy Tree, that I heard of Mice and Men. And I thought, oh, th this is just a wonderful opera. I mean, everyone's been talking about the story, so elemental. Of course, the, the novel, the novella, really, was a great favourite of mine. I think when I was in school. We read it in, when I was at school here in Australia. And uh, I thought, gosh, that's a powerful story for an opera. It's got a tragic ending. Well, that's a, can't go past that. <laughs> and, uh, and it had wonderful characterizations. And I thought the adaptation, the libretto, Carlo does all his own librettos. Uh, which is very rare among composers. I mean, Wagner did, but they're incomprehensible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Carlyle's aren't incomprehensible. You're clearly and not putting up, up your hand to direct the ring. It's, it's obvious. <laughs> I don't want to direct the ring, no. I mean, there's you know, some wonderful music, but I don't want to. I'd never be able to understand it. Um, I'm a simple soul. Um, the, uh, so I said to Carlyle at the time, you know, listen, this would be a wonderful opera to do in Australia. None of your operas have been done there. And uh, then when I, I came back here, I, I did um, Streetcar Named Desire and then talked to Lyndon Terracini. I said, there's this wonderful American opera. Of course, he knew it. Mm. These guys, they know everything. And he said, you're right, it is a wonderful opera. We'll do it. So we went on from there. Mm. So that's a, a very personal subject to you since you have a son with special needs and I was just wondering whether you could say something about how um, Tony's characterization resonates for you as the father of someone. Well it did resonate right from the beginning because um, yes I, I have a son who has Down syndrome and, and I was amazed when we even the first few days of the rehearsal how truthful Tony's portrayal of the character was there were there were so many aspects of it that reminded me of my son even the way he stood and the way he looked and the way he thought about things and I said to Tony at one point I, I find it uncanny how accurate you've got that and then Tony told me that he'd, he'd actually worked with children with disabilities mm. and observed them very closely I mean it was it was something that had always worried me about the opera because I thought that role could be so easily caricatured, misunderstood. There's, there's millions of things that could go wrong. Mm. But um, he does it with such, in a way, simplicity and fidelity to, the, uh, to what these, these people are like. And also, you know, it's marvellously the way he makes him likeable. Mm. Even though he murders a girl in it, it's... <laughs> Uh, it was a great experience to do it. And, and the other, all the other singers as well got a very fine cast. I mean, all of them, we've said, you know, try and keep it simple 
absolutely truthful to the characters, mm. you know, without any big operatic mm. gestures mm. and all that. Well, uh, is that partly because it is a piece of realism as yes, literature? Yes, that, that's and exactly so right. I was wondering yeah. whether realism and opera are a natural fit or whether there's a bit of a kind of tension and a battle <laughs> going on there. I think they fit because I think the emotionalism of the music carries such, I mean, that's got such strength and uh, it really, it's really underlying the characters that are on stage to such an extent that you don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be with the big traditional operatic gestures. I think, in fact, probably the five or six or seven operas or whatever it is I've directed, I've always tried to make the characters very believable and immediate. I mean, I did the same thing with Streetcar. It just strikes me that um, with Bruce and John here, we should talk just for a moment about the influence of movies um, on, on this production, because certainly in the rehearsal room, you've talked, Bruce, quite a lot about the 1939 movie and how much you liked it and how, how you felt that it was um, a very true adaptation of the novel and that you used it in some respects as a, as a reference point for the production, just on little details like things about the way they carried their bedrolls and various other kind of details. And I was just wondering whether you and John might like to say something about the films in relation to your production. You mean something you haven't just said? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the 1938 or 39 film, uh, which is directed by Lewis Milestone, who, who directed All Quiet on the Western Front, the original one, is, uh, I think, an extremely, extremely fine bit of filmmaking. And, of course, it had the advantage, you see, of being made in California only a couple of years after the novel was written. Mm. And um, <clears throat> so we did look at it to help us with the costumes and details of the dressing in the bunkhouse and, yes, the bedrolls that they slept in. I got, them, I got the people here at Opera Australia, to, the props people, to copy them more or less, so that we knew what was in them. There was a blanket, there was um, cups and things like that. Because I thought, well, if the film was made at that time by a very, very distinguished director, I'm sure he got it right. And it did help a lot with the authenticity, because although I think um, I spent a lot of my childhood on a farm near Kulo, run by my uncle, and I used to watch the shearers come every year to shear the sheep, and they lived in a place that was very like what we have in this. And that helped me a lot, too. But that combined with the movie uh, helped um, to realise the whole thing, I think, the, the details. Anything else? Yeah, John, I mean, how different is designing an opera production from designing a movie, apart from the fact that there are far more scenes that you have to cover in a film than you do on an opera stage? Well, with a, with a movie, of course, you're dealing with uh, absolute realism. Mm. Um, on the op operatic stage, it's a sort of heightened realism. Uh, is not entirely uh, true to life, but um, uh, uh, films are so different, uh, the, the technique is different, the timing is different. I think I basically prefer to work on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, there are lots of... But working with Bruce, Bruce always insists on realism, so I have to... Have you sound to critical. Uh, no, no, I, I just... <laughs> I have to sneak in a few unrealistic <laughs> elements. <laughs>